Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, Coffee Microcaps results wrap. You're all very welcome. Uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. And uh, for all our returning attendees, uh, you're very welcome to a uh, little bit of a change in time, in the afternoon rather than morning, but um, we've still got uh, the same structure, which I'm just going to run through quick. First of all, though, I'd like to give a shout out to ShareSite, who are our virtual event sponsors here, Coffee Microcaps. Um, if you are looking for some software to track your investments, performance, tax reporting, if anybody's deep in that, trying to get it filed with the, the ATO, it's a, um, a service I use myself, so I can definitely recommend them. Uh, compliance and disclaimer slide. Uh, for anybody who is joining us for the first time, the companies we normally have presenting on here are capped under 300 million, uh, are in revenue and approaching cash flow break even, are indeed are already profitable as some of our uh, companies are today. We generally don't have companies from the resources or biotech sector, uh, so what I like to call industrial microcaps, which kind of covers all the other sectors, technology, uh, retail, uh, professional services. Uh, structured this morning's webinar, we've got four companies presenting over the next two hours. Each company's got 30 minutes, which we'll break down into a kind of a 20-minute presentation, 10 minutes of Q&A. If you do have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. just makes it easier for me to moderate the question. And um, Please note the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. Uh, you can follow us pretty much on all the socials, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, as I mentioned, the recording of this webinar, indeed, all our previous events. We've got well over 100 company presentations uh, there now if you want to go back and look at them. And I do write a weekly, sorry, a monthly uh, newsletter, which you can get on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, first up, we're going to go out west. We've got Nick Pollock joining us from Perth, uh, returning to give us an update on K2Fly. After that, then we'll have Scott Greasley and Matt Dudek from uh, Anagenics who will be joining us. Then we'll be back in Sydney for Reckon with Sam Allert, who's coming back to give us an update. And then finally, we'll have uh, Nick England from Corum Group. But that's enough from me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Nick, if you want to start sharing your screen. I'll let you know when I can see it coming through. Yeah, I can see it now. If you just want to go to full screen mode or slide share mode there, Nick. Just so we get the, the full effect of it. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see that, but it is showing the the, the next upcoming slide. So I'm not, if you're happy to go at this view, we can, but it might be better if we, now. Get the, um, if we can get the full effect of it. Uh, I'm just trying to see. If you just click on display settings first, Nick, just see if we can't get it into um, up the top there. Sorry. Um... Okay. Yeah, and just see. Uh, duplicate slide share. How about that? Yeah, there we go. That's better. Now we've got the the, the full screen going. There okay, go. ready to go. Yep, you can take it away, Nick. Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, giving of your precious time to to listen to this story today and. Um, for those of, the, of you that are new to the story, I look forward to uh, sharing it with you. It's pretty exciting. And uh, for those of you that have been following us for some time, uh, this is a new deck. So we uh, have some new content on here. So um, I'm uh, pretty excited about sharing that as well. Um, but let's get let's get into it. Clearly, we're, we're an ASX listed um, stock. Um, we are a technology provider um, and we are driving a new space uh, called resource governance. And a good part of today's discussion will be explaining the uh, explaining what that is, as well as 
explaining what the market uh, uh, tail, tailwinds are that are driving our rapid growth. And um, this continues to be a growth story. Um, and um, But it's also important for before we get into that, that this is a, a very purpose-driven organisation. Um, and in terms of the people that work uh, at K2Fly and our stakeholders are passionate about what we do. And uh, in fact, we have a number of people working in this organisation that have come out of big mining, the BHPs, the Anglo-Americans, et cetera. Um, and the reason for that is, is that what we're doing, particularly in mining, but not just limited to mining, is uh, in, in this age of radical transparency and radical change uh, in, in uh, communities and what they expect and shareholders and what they expect, um, we are, we are firm believers that the world uh, needs to change in, in terms of energy transition. We need a lot more mining for that, but mining needs to do a better job uh, on the way it discloses information, shares information, brings communities along and maintains its social license to operate. And we know for a fact that a lot of the leaders of these mining companies realise that too, uh, hence why it's very high on their priorities. So we're addressing that market. We're addressing that market through technology and we're addressing that market through what we call resource governance. So that's really key to what we're talking about today. So that might sound very woke and very uh, very ambitious and very um, uh, la di da, but uh, I can assure you, and um, this slide speaks to that a lot in terms of um, the biggest mining companies and 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 other utilities organisations out there are taking this very very seriously. So, quick snapshot of the business down the bottom there. Uh, we have the ten solutions that we have in market today uh, that we built over the last few years uh, through. Uh, our own building, but also through acquisition. Uh, and then, you know, what speaks very loudly is the quality of the, the customer base that we built more or less over the last three years, um, which is quite extraordinary for a company of our size. Um, so I don't need to read out those names to you. That's seven of the top, top 10 biggest mining companies in the world by market capitalization um, that are already contracted with us, but then a long list uh, of 31 customers that we have uh, all over the globe. So it's important to understand that this um, this is an Australian-based mining technology company, but our business is global, which is not surprising given mining is a very global industry. Um, we have a strong footprint in Australia of 60%, but we also have 20% of our revenues coming out of Europe and Africa, uh, and then 20% coming out of the Americas, both of which are growing and really important markets for us. And particularly uh, with some of the changes we see uh, in the Americas at the moment, uh, with the um, uh, you know the IRA Act over there and and the investment that's going on and uh, their decoupling from China and and uh, investment in alternative energies and and battery minerals and the like is is a very very rich space for us. Uh, we recently revisited uh, the sites that are reporting uh, through our software, which is eight hundred over eight hundred and fifty, nearly nine hundred, um, which is um, pretty exciting as that grows. Um, that's exciting across many, many countries reporting and different commodity groups. So yeah, really, really uh, extraordinary uh, growth over the last few years. Our, our licensing model, so our business model is um, software as a service, multi-year contracts, generally three or five years, uh, averaging at the moment, sort of somewhere in between about averaging about 43 months. And the model is um, annual licenses in advance. So. Uh, we get the money in the bank at, at, at the beginning of the contract for the first year, uh, and then we we uh, license annually after that. So nice, uh, and, and certainly from very credible customers that generally pay on time. So this resource governance uh, space that I was talking about or referring to at the beginning of the discussion, um, we break it into two parts, which is mineral resource governance and natural resource governance. Uh, mineral resource governance is very focused around the disclosure of a mining company's mineral resources and reserves. So for, for those of you that invest in mining, uh, I suspect this is mainly an Australian audience. Most of you have got some exposure to mining. Um, you would have heard about sort of jork reports and things like that. That is the a highly regulated, one of the most regulated parts of mining, which is how you disclose what effectively is your mineral inventory. But obviously our inventory sits below the ground and an average investor can't go and look at that or count it. So you have to be very, you have to have a lot of trust in what that mining company is disclosing to you through the JORC regulations, but those regulations extend globally and they're not called JORC, they're called a whole bunch of stuff, which we won't go into now. 
Um, but our software supports that process, makes sure that there is a rigorous governance process in the way that that information is collected, that adheres to the standard, the regulation, and then is disclosed to the stock market. So you can imagine how important that is to a mining company. And just to give you a, a sense of how important that is and, and how important our software is, you know, so sort of those five companies on the top left-hand side there. So by market capitalization, 66% of the biggest mining companies are, are using our software to build and disclose that information, which is really important. Um, that is a great place for us to start engaging with these organizations um, because it is a corporate um, thing and it's about risk. And so what we talk about here is uh, in relation to ESG, without G, the big G that we provide here, there is no ENS. So you've got to get those basics in place. So I guess what I'd say is if a lot of these companies are talking more and more, particularly the junior end about their ESG sustainability strategies and their ESG initiatives, if they can't get this fundamental thing right, well, then um, it's questionable whether, as to whether, you know, uh, the information they're providing on a sustainability or, or an ESG platform is indeed credible. And that's what we bring. Um, you can see on the bottom right hand side there um, our, how our business has grown over the last few years where we had a really strong starting point in the mineral resource governance and how that has increased to the natural resource governance, which is land and all land intensive users. So not just mining, but a, a whole bunch of other industries which we talk about as well. Um, but you can see that that is becoming you know, a bigger proportion of our business over the last few years. The, uh, the lovely thing about that is, is that it's um, uh, the, the, the deal values in there are bigger. So we land in this natural, in this mineral resource governance space and expand into the natural resource governance space across these massive clients, um, which is very, very exciting. And um, so we're very pleased with the progress. Financially, yes, we're a micro cap, uh, particularly at the moment in the, in the way the current market is, uh, but we are a real business in terms of uh, some of the things that Mark said at the outset in terms of a, a strong revenue base. This is a, a growth story. Um, so the key metrics that we talk about, particularly uh, when it comes to financial metrics, are obviously revenue. Uh, and you can see that that has grown 28% year on year with a compound average growth rate of 36% over the last four years. Um, and that's every year for four years, if, if, you, if you break that down. Um, similarly, we talk about annual recurring revenue. So that is the, the license revenue that we that we book every year. That's a core metric for a software business like us. Um, as of Q4, well, we sat at 7.5 million. So that's obviously making up, you know, more than 50% of our revenues is that recurring revenue. So that's contracted, multi-year, very sticky revenue. So that's the nice thing about investing in a company like this. And then it starts to compound over time naturally. Uh, through CPI and other pricing increasing mechanisms. Uh, and that's grown at a very healthy 25% in the last 12 months. Uh, and again, really healthy percent, 48% CAGR over the last uh, four years as well. So really strong uh, in terms of growth top line there. Um, obviously, as a, as a technology company, we're investing very heavily in, 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 the, in the technology. Um, our, our goal is to uh, get to operating cash flow break even as quick as we can. You can see uh, very, very good progress there in the last three years in particular, how that you're getting closer and closer to break even point. We got really close this year. Uh, and uh, yeah, if it wasn't for a, a one late payment, we would have been there. But, uh, but nevertheless, we're, we're on the right path. So revenue going up, costs, operating costs coming down although we do continue to invest in our product and we're very deliberate about that. Um, so, so obviously that is on a, the right trajectory in terms of getting to where we want to be. Uh, in terms of, of initiatives that we've got this year for the business, we want to continue the sales growth, continue the, to focus on, on that, um, that break even point of view uh, objective as well. But we also are investing in the business in terms of being our product leadership, building new products, uh, investing in our sales team, given that we have uh, this expansive global uh, footprint, how do we get to market uh, in the traditional sense, but how do we get there in other ways, a la we have opportunities to white label our technology into other businesses, uh, technology businesses with a broader distribution mechanism, watch this space, but also uh, using resellers through partnerships, particularly with 
mining consultants and engineering consultants, environmental consultants and what have you. So we've got initiatives in place this year to start really looking at that, as well as taking us into alternative markets where we haven't been before. More on that later. Um, really continue to invest in our products and making sure that we are building and delivering very good quality products that are fast, quick and easy to implement, which goes to our customer success side of things, making sure that we can expand our customer base as land and expand is a critical part of, of our growth story. We've been very successful at both. Um, without spending uh, too much time preaching, I suppose, about ESG and the things driving what the growth of this business is, um, I, I mentioned earlier on about how, you know, mining executives and board members uh, spend a lot of time lying awake at night worrying about licence to operate and ESG. And you can see that in one of the many, many graphics uh, that are out there at the moment in terms of on the right-hand side there, the e EY um, uh, survey, if you like, about what, what are the top issues that they're considering. Um, and Cody Fly is absolutely hitting a lot of these. I talked about, um, you know, the, the 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 fundamentals of the energy shift that's happening in the world at the moment and how we need something like 300 more mines uh, in the short term in order to address the demand for critical battery minerals um, and you know, critical minerals in order to make that energy transition. And we the whole world needs to speed that up. But there is fundamentally a big lack of trust in the mining industry and um, in terms of communities and investors not in the outcomes, but in some of the impacts. So that's where we play a really strong role in helping those organisations to, um, to talk about their operations, to win the trust uh, and to demonstrate that through sort of um, proper systems that are uh, highly transparent and highly auditable. Um, so many, many drivers as to, to how, this, how the world is changing and how the world is thinking about these things. To put that into perspective about what we do here we we talk about uh, along the top there is you know, a selection of our of our solutions, um, and I'm just going to put that into context in terms of how the world has shifted very very dramatically. On the left hand side, we talk about resource disclosure and land access, and two two areas where we play very strongly. That's you know the uh, mineral resource governance and, and mineral resource disclosure that we talked about earlier as the the early part of our business, highly highly regulated. Uh, across the world, uh, um, obviously really important for stock markets to understand and appreciate this information, which has to be spot on. Um, so from a traditional valuation of a mining company perspective, really, first of all, you know, investors wanted to know, hey, do you have access to the land? Do you have tenure? Uh, and then do you have a resource? And then I will value you on the basis of tons grade prevailing price of the day. Those two things were the, the main drivers. They are still really, really critically important. And we clearly play in that space. But if you move across to the right, you start to see things that what we call soft law. So, you know, tenure and uh, and and resource disclosure are, are, are hard law, highly regulated. Um, the other things, albeit there are regulations associated with cultural heritage, associated with the environment, what have you, they're a bit softer in terms of the way they have been managed traditionally. So those things are really, really coming into valuations today and the way a mining company can manage its shareholders, its stakeholders, its communities, or raise capital. They have to be able to talk about these things, and they have to be able to talk them in in a, in a credible way that adheres to global standards or, dare I say, community standards. So, the the classic case in point would be uh, heritage management um, and the issues that Rio Tinto faced uh, with Duke and Gorge, uh, with the terrible or the tragic destruction of 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 priceless cultural heritage there. Rio Tinto didn't actually break a law in, in doing that. However, they clearly crossed a community line. And this is the sort of grey area um, which needs to be managed um, across this, this spectrum, if you like, of hard and soft law. The actual fact is that if it's hard or soft law, it doesn't really matter anymore in terms of the impacts it can have on your business as a mining company in particular and the damage it can do. Dare I say, if you're a BHP or a Rio Tinto and these things happen, you have the balance sheet, you have the history to get through it. If you're a small to mid cap miner, you need to take this stuff really seriously because if you have a, an, in, a, an event like that, uh, which is a risk event, um, and you haven't managed that risk with appropriate systems, well, it's unlikely that the shareholders in the community will accept you to do that and to carry forth. So it can be catastrophic, let's say, to the business. 
in terms of the way we see this market and how big this market is or isn't, um, we um, we have a total addressable market of, of, of about one billion. Um, so that is taking our solutions across different industries. I made mention of uh, initiatives in the business this year to start pushing into those those other industries like onshore oil and gas, um, alternative energy um, spaces. So they are any any large users of land, uh, linear assets like rail and pipelines, which cross lots of boundaries. They'd be ownership boundaries, tenure boundaries, traditional owner boundaries, heritage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are natural use cases for our land management solutions. In terms of, so that's the bigger the bigger market, which is obviously global and a $1 billion market. When we talk about our serviceable and obtainable market, that's the one right in front of us now. We're looking at about a $62 million target. We're at sort of seven and a half million of that ARR now. So we're laser focused on those things on the uh, the bottom uh, the bottom categories there and obviously demonstrating good growth in those. So this is what I, I guess I was adhering to before and it's what we call the golden thread about how you tie the resource disclosure and the the hard the hard uh, the hard law, if you like, on the left hand side together with the other things. And it, you know, so we are building this platform out over time such that we can be leveraging uh, the same platform from a technology basis to address all of these things from a company wide perspective. Obviously, addressing that very very important uh, ESG risk profile that these companies are managing through this golden thread. Um, and ultimately what this is delivering uh, to the client is that that license to operate. So and it, it centers around the land and then the, the ways that you report around that land. So that's critical. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just skip through this. The other side of things is as a technology company, we are collecting, you saw the sort of nearly 900 sites that we're collecting data from around the world. That is a is not our data, it's the customer's data, but there it is a rich source of improvement for those organisations and, and how we can use that information, not only to report, disclose, manage um, the important things they're doing on the ground and how they talk about it, but then to leverage that data in order to get ahead of things and, and start to get uh, preventative about events happening and how we stop things like Duke and Gorge happening or Brumadino Dam happening um, and using the data to be really proactive in that. So that's a big opportunity for us going forward as we build out this platform. And we build out the platform in two ways. We take our existing solutions and we add them into new markets globally, which is down sort of the right-hand side. And then we also add additional solutions to the markets we're successful in. So in mining, for instance, we started off with a resource disclosure. Now we're adding the model manager to that and then the reconciliation to that. So we can expand within those customers that we already have focused on our, on our, um, on our, serviceable, obtainable market. And here's a bit of an example of that. So one of the questions I often get is from people saying, oh, well, you signed up sort of all these big name clients. Why is the revenue only this? Well, the point is, is that we've signed up those big name clients in certain areas. We haven't signed them up across the whole 10 solutions. So the point here is the white space that we have is, is vast, just in mining. And now we're not talking just about mining, but in mining itself, we've still got a lot of white space to move into. So you know, we work with a number of those clients globally and corporately, particularly around resource disclosure, the one down the middle there. So that is a whole of, uh, but then in other areas, BHP, we're working with them um, just in the Pilbara, for instance. So we've got a massive opportunity to move throughout those organisations, whether it be BHP, Rio or Newmont, uh, in terms of putting our solutions into different regions and different operating and commodity groups. Quickly, um, in terms of uh, what we're doing with, with the industry, I've talked a lot about uh, how we disclose uh, the most important information to the stock markets. Oh, well, the, the companies disclose that information using our technology. Um, we're making a big contribution to the tailings debate and helping companies get to the new tailing standards, which are very important at the moment. Um, we work significantly across land in the Pilbara. We work with all of the majors in the Pilbara at the moment. And we've taken that expertise and how we manage land with those organisations. Now we're working with a company called Imaris out of Paris, uh, which is uh, again, taking that global. So that's really exciting. And again, again that's part of our, our growth plan. And then finally in heritage, we work with some of the biggest players 
in the Pilbara today, um, but also we work with traditional owner groups. So we have a special relationship with a company called um, The Keeping Place, which uh, works with TOs, and we've got 11 traditional owner groups on that system using the same technology that the, our mining customers use, which is really nice for us, and again, uh, to be working with with the traditional owners to protect heritage, et cetera. I'm interested in time, so I'm just going to quickly get to a few uh, a few usual stuff. Um, in terms of uh, share price, disappointing. I think we all are disappointed in the micro cap space at the moment, but part of that is uh, low volumes based in around the fact that a big chunk of K2 fly is owned institutionally. So, uh, you know, over sort of 65% of it is tied up with institutions like Tribeca, First Centia, Regal and, and West Farmers. Uh, and then last year we took on uh, a, a strategic investment from MapTech. MapTech is the biggest uh, privately owned software business in the world. So MapTech don't do what we do. They appreciate that we play in the same space largely and value what we do and also uh, uh, mature enough to realise that it's very difficult for any other company to sort of try and catch up to what we do because we're largely uncontested. Uh, and so they thought they'd take a stake in us and they are a big contributor to um, to us in terms of support, but also access and, and uh, Peter Johnson, the chair, has come onto our board, which has been fantastic. Speaking of which, uh, we have a very strong board. Um, just talked about Peter Johnson and we recently appointed Pauline Bamis, uh, who's very, very strong on governance and ESG credentials as well. So with that, uh, I think I can wrap up with some summaries in terms of high growth uh, revenue, very sticky revenue, really strong tailwinds, um, first mover opportunities, uh, and our moat continues to expand um, on, a, on a, what is going to become a very changing and uh, dynamic space over the next few years as we define resource governance. Uh, Mark, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, just a couple of questions. One is a, a maybe a bit of a perennial question because we've talked about it before, but just on the, I was interested in the the chart you had on the you know the expansion of sites from you know twenty nineteen up to today. How much of that, and it talks to one of the other slides. How much of that is, you know, expanding the number of sites um, with existing customers? You know, rolling it out from. You know, one site in the Pilbara to another to maybe even even another country versus, you know, brand new customers that you've won over that like last last four years. If if you can maybe just maybe break it down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question because we actually tried to uh, come up with a a part of a chart that showed that. So basically, sites using um, more than one, more than two of our solutions. Um, so, so the, the eight over 850 is the aggregation of those, but it's probably about half, um, is, is using more than one solution, but it's different parts of the operation as well. So you, you'd have like a mineral disclosure out of one site, but then you'll have a multiples of, um, tailings disclosures, and then you'll have heritage disclosures, you know, within the same operations, but they're coming from different parts of different discrete groups within the organization. So yeah um but yet yeah, a lot a good proportion of that are customers using more of our solutions in similar operations and then i just want to talk about capex um you also mentioned that you know it was broadly the same year over year if we look into fy24 um should we be thinking around the, the, that 2.7 million hours their plans for you know a big upgrade of one of the one of the products to like really um you know take it to the next level or you know is that two points yeah so so we we um in the last couple so so the answer is um similar similar level of investment um we have uh spent the last uh, year or two investing heavily in that mineral resource um platform and and have basically rewritten it so we will be that's that was released at the end of last calendar year and we're just sort of tidying up that now and actually relaunching uh, that combined with our model manager product at the end of this calendar year. So that that will that project will be largely complete. That that constitutes the basis for our platform. Um, and and as you saw with the growth in the sort of natural resource governance or land management uh, market, we'll start to turn our attention to to building that out now as well on the same platform. 
So yeah, similar continued investment in the products, um, coming up, rolling off, rolling teams off one project and rolling onto new stuff uh, as we move forward. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but but net net we we can expect the kind of same same dollar value. But yeah, it'd yeah. be good to. I know you've been talking about that project for a while, so it'd be good to actually get that uh, done and dusted. Yeah, well, we, and we have um, we've had some major wins on that already. So, um, you know, uh, Anglo American, you know, one of those top five global miners are on the new re- uh, are going uh, implementing the new resource governance or resource disclosure platform now. Um, ArcelorMittal, which we announced uh, not you know Q3, I think it was uh, Q2, uh, are on that as well. Uh, and Aramet from Paris um, uh, that signed at the end of last fiscal year are on that. So, so we are definitely already having that in market. Okay, perfect. Nick, we are just up on time, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for coming back on again and giving us uh, an update on, on all two things K2 Fly. And uh, we'll keep an eye out on the, for further ASX announcements as we push through FY24. Thanks, Mark. It's very much my pleasure. And thanks, everybody, for your interest. And obviously, my contact details are there. And if people would like to reach out to me directly, I'm more than happy to uh, respond. Okay, great. Nick, if I could ask you to please stop sharing your screen, because I do know we have uh, Scott and Matthew standing by from Anagenix. Uh, Matt or Scott, if you want to share your presentation, I'll let you know. Uh, yeah, no problem, Mark. Uh, uh, It's coming through now. Uh, yeah, I can see it now, uh, Scott. Can adjust the view, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Looks good. Okay, can you uh, see myself and Matt as well? Uh, I can. Yeah, you guys look good in the boardroom there. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Um, well, th- firstly, mate, thanks for uh, inviting us back coffee micro caps i know it's been a little while since anagenics was represented here so um excited to kind of join the webinar um obviously we met in person in sydney last time so uh maybe we can do that again next time you schedule um, the one face to face but appreciate the opportunity today so as you mentioned with me today is matthew dudek who is the cfo for anagenics um our aim today was really kind of to jump on and provide a bit of a brief background of um anagenics or am1 and I'll discuss our FY23 results, which we uh, announced by the 4A this morning, and then help answer any questions really on the direction of, of Anagenics and the future as to where we're taking this business. So um, with that, if I can get my own slide to change, there we go. Um, so yeah, really simply, first off, who, who is Anagenics? So um, we kind of define ourselves today as a beauty, health and wellness portfolio company. Um, really, our aim is to deliver profitable growth through uh, consumer brands and product solutions. So the way we kind of do that is through a number of in-house or IP-owned brands, uh, Evolus and New Spa, as you can see on the screen there. Um, we own a beauty uh, professional beauty distribution business called BLC Cosmetics, which serves just over a 1,000 accounts around Australia and New Zealand. Um, they, that distributes international and local brands on exclusive distribution agreements. And um, also we obviously operate a direct-to-consumer or e-commerce business platform. So really in summary, um, portfolio style business servicing consumers in the professional beauty space is the best way to think about us today. However, we are going on an m a journey, uh, which we can talk about as part of the presentation, which will hopefully see the business build further and broader into health and wellness um, as we grow. So um, as we stand today, just a kind of quick snapshot of, I guess, the uh, sort of financial and commercial positioning of the business. So um, yeah, like I said, almost $10 million worth of uh, revenue in FY23, which was announced. Um, um, they're unordered the numbers that went out this morning. That includes revenue and other income. That's up 26% um, on prior year. But that's on a continuing operation basis there were some decisions that were made last year in terms of exiting markets etc cetera, etc cetera. so when you think about how the business will will continue moving forward on a like-for-like basis 
Um, that that 26% growth represents that. Um, we're still small team, small business, uh, circa 20 employees on a, on a full-time headcount, primarily based here uh, in Sydney. However, we do have sales or business development um, team around the country. Um, and then as I, as I touched on, we have key brands in our portfolio that we distribute. There's sort of some of them are uh, outlined below there. Uh, Thalgo, which is a French premium spa brand, Hydropeptide, a cosmeceutical brand out of the US, uh, Comfort Zone, an Italian skincare brand. So just wanted to provide some flavor as to uh, the, the business that we're, we're operating on today or we have with us today. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we have two brands that we own um, that are and, and have the IP of Evolus, which is a hair care, hair regrowth product. Um, that's distributed by the US and China with um, distribution partners. We also have a license agreement in Japan. Um, that licensed agreement in Japan uh, came about as a management buyout, whereby we had an office in the market last year. And effectively, the team, uh, yeah, like I said, bought, bought that business from us. Um, we have a, a, a trailing royalty uh, that will expand for the next 15 years off the back of that. Um, so yeah, the, the business is quite diverse in terms of the consumer segment uh, when, it, when you think about the products that, that we offer. Um, the primary vehicle of distribution today is this BLC Cosmetics um, uh, distribution business. So um, I'll skip on to the, the next page. Um, I thought it was worth that we provide a little bit of kind of color around the segment and why we believe um, you know, that there is an opportunity in beauty, health and wellness, particularly in Australia and New Zealand. Um, what we're sort of seeing now more so than ever, um, I guess consumers are seeking a, an a, a ethical and effective products um, that really promote this sort of positive self-image. Um, we believe that our brands and our products, because they are legacy or hero from uh, the, the professional space, meaning that they're clinically validated, you know, they have efficacy, uh, they're typically listed with uh, bodies like FDA or TGA, et cetera, that it, you know, a consumer can really lean to these products, understanding that they do what they say they will do. Um, again, focusing on where our brands and business is distributed today, we are really in the professional space, which is typically a salon or a spa where a, a beauty therapist or an esthetician has to have an accreditation to a perform a, a treatment, um, as opposed to being in the retail end of the market, which might be a Sephora or a Mecca where you don't actually need that sort of training and that consultation to, to be prescribed a product. Everywhere we sell our products, ultimately you, you can be be sure that you're being served and, and, and supported by someone that, that um, understands what they're selling, uh, selling to you. So for us, we believe this is where our brands are well positioned in this market. Um, like the macro indicators remain strong for the category. You know, with, there's a continued focus from consumers seeking this ethical and social responsibility um, whilst they're looking to be informed about their product decision-making. So with brands like, like we, we have in our portfolio, something like Comfort Zone from Italy, as I mentioned, is B Corp certified. Um, and Nika, which is our Australian organic, vegan, natural, halal-based makeup brand. Um, or Alpha H, which is a new key partner we've just brought on. Um, they run a, a program called the Encore Ship Program, which is a return to work platform for women who have been out, out of the workforce for an extended period. So again, the brands and the products that we're engaging with under the Anagenics banner um, you know, have depth and meaning to them. They're authentic in the space. And we believe that's where the USP for us comes in to connect to consumers. Um, effectively, we're not just transacting product. There is there is a real a real rationale or reason as to why. Um, and that's where I think this consumer data we're sharing shows it's ultimately what consumers are seeking in this space. Um, in addition to, I guess, the, the, the strong consumer interest um, we believe that the, the, the segment remains really resilient and strong, particularly here in Australia. Um, I, I mentioned at the start, we've kind of gone on a bit of journey in the last 12 months where we have exited uh, markets like the USA and Japan. And that was all to do with consolidating and refocusing on Australia. Um, we believe that there is a wide space in this market. Um, we believe that the work we have done in the past 12 months um, has set us up to, to sort of capitalize on that, I guess. Um, and so we've obviously seen a number of failures in this category in, in recent recent times. Um, but for us, we sort of have laid the foundations for that sustained profitability. Um, I guess we've kind of proven that we can, uh, sorry, I just skipped ahead there. Um, I'll get to the next slide. It's just sort of setting up why we think that we can um, deliver what we're saying we're doing because 
again, we've kind of proven that we have um, the ability to complete M&A transactions. We've reinforced in the, the talent and the foundation of our business. Um, our results are proving that we have this, this platform or this foundation to build upon. Um, we've proactively reduced our costs through some of those initiatives, such as exiting the USA or, or Japan. Um, and as I mentioned, or you might have seen recently, um, Mark, obviously we discussed that as of last week, we've acquired a new business, uh, the Face Medi Group, which we'll talk about at the end here as well. So from, from our AM1 standpoint, you know, we've got kind of con strong consumer tailwinds. We think that there's a stability in the Australian marketplace from a macro standpoint versus international markets. And we've really set ourselves up to kind of leverage and scale from that now. Um, that's not gone without the last sort of 12 to 18 months of hard work to, to get to this point, um, to shorten, you know, continuing losses that the business has had previously, but we're really now on, on the door, sort of doorstep to, to, to step forward. So I'll, um, I'll let Matt talk specifically to the FY23 results. Um, so Matt. Thanks, Scott. Uh, just a quick overview and reinforcement of what Scott was saying. Basically, we, we are a $10 million business. Um, similar revenue to last year, but if you break down that number, you'll see that it's quite a good result given that we did dispose of a, an underperforming business um, being in Japan under a management buyer. But if we concentrate on, our, I guess, the continuing operations, like we said, uh, they're significantly up and um, we've annualised for the 12, full 12 months with BOC on board now and we're hitting our strides with some particularly good wins on the board. E-commerce makes up the bulk of, of, of our business, sorry, B2B it makes the bulk of our business, about 80% of the revenue. And uh, e-commerce is growing component of about 2 million. And that's, and that's uh, that channel collectively is up 30%. So um, there's a lot of opportunity here. We're continuing to invest in people, in infrastructure to um, take advantage of that. Um, but our unique positioning is that we do have a network through the um, B2B channel of, of over a thousand individual spas and salons, which um, is quite, like I say, unique and, and, and differentiates us as, this, as a business in this sector. Um, so overall, a strong result on the revenue side, underpinned by the brands that we, we offer. Um, they're recognized brands, they're overseas brands, and they're quite resilient in what's been a really, I guess, tough macroeconomic sort of environment. Um, touching again on costs, by removing Japan from, from our business, we've simplified things. I mean, it was an under underperforming business for in its last few years, particularly. So we've avoided um, additional losses by doing so. We restructured the US, um, and we basically reduced our key key lines in cost, being the advertising, marketing, um, headcount. Yeah, you know, collectively about twenty five percent. So year on year. So taken together. It's um it's been a good outcome for us on the bottom line. Um, on an EBITDA level, we've we've improved um, significantly, and we've also found obviously identified more cost savings in in our corporate corporate costs, which were I guess unnecessary to where we want to go. So if we take out a lot of the noise that I just mentioned, what 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 we're really coming down to is an underlying result, which is um, saving of about. 43% on last year. So we've, we've we've generated for the result of $1.6 million loss this year. It is a loss, but we've come from a larger losses and we're on our road to recovery, like I've got outlined. Um, the key call outs here is obviously that Japan was a was a massive one that um, of 0.9 million that uh, impacted us. But if we remove that and, and some one-off costs associated with restructuring, all, all, a lot of which are already paying back in savings, that underlying result is quite encouraging. And, and as a business going forward now with a new acquisition that uh, we, we will talk about just, just next, um, it's a great a great opportunity to, to, to generate an, a business which we feel can be close to 30 million. Um, our balance sheet, next slide. Our yeah. balance sheet is pretty strong. It's the leanest and strongest it's ever been actually. Some of the key points here is our cash bank has um, been replenished. We had a capital raise earlier this year, underwritten by our major shareholder. Um, our stock levels are being managed very closely and are, uh, are significantly down in terms of where they were even a few years ago, given that we've sold Japan. Um, we're progressively working um, every month to, to get them even, even less to, to max, maximise our 
our working capital in the sense that to, to make sure we're, we're even leaner. So um, we've got better terms with our brand partners and our customers, and we've still got the benefit of um, some deferred consideration that's going to come out, come out in the form of a, a royalty or an earn out from, from the sale of Japan over the next 10, 15 years. Um, fundamentally, we've eliminated all the all the liabilities, all the loans that is on our on our balance sheet, which which were associated with Japan of about $1.3 million. And if we add in the other liability that we had for the for the payment of the purchase of BLC, that's that's over $2.3 million reduction on last year. So it's a it's a great foundation to 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 which to build and scale. So what does that mean for next year? Well basically we're, we're doing the same thing but more. Uh, last week, we announced our acquisition of, of a business um, under our strategy of mergers and acquisitions, uh, Face Medi Group. I mean, this business will in inject scale initially in the order of about 50% more revenue, of $5 million re revenue. And there's a whole bunch of savings that we believe that we can we can take out of this and it, it will assist the bottom line greatly for really what was a, a, an opportunistic acquisition in our, in our minds. Um, we continue to work closely on, on building margin for our brands. We're bringing on more brands. We brought, last year, we brought on Uspar. We bought that, again, opportunistically from BWX. Um, great, great brand. It ticks all the boxes, has all, all the things going for it that the market wants and needs, and that will help our margin. Um, and we continue to invest. We're investing in our, in our IT, our people, and our platforms. So... Taken together, we're 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 heading in a very um good good place, um, and we look forward to uh, doing sharing our results more. So just to kind of build on the M and A piece, particularly around Face Medi, as as Matt mentioned. So previously announced, Analytics has been on an M and A journey or, or or a view to to acquire businesses that suit the portfolio. Um, Face Medi was probably the first transaction that we completed um, in recent time post BLC, which was about eighteen months ago now. Um, and so, as we outlined last week, really what we see is that this is an important step forward for for the um, AM1 group. So, just some sort of background on Face Medi and what what that business is. Es essentially, that is a professional clinic based business. So they have their own salon, they trade out of the salon, but they also have built a really sort of sustainable and credible marketplace business, e commerce business. So they're growing at circa twenty four percent on prior year. Um, and like Matt said, it provides an additional $5 million worth of revenue for AM1 today. Um, it provides us with greater touch points for our consumers from a direct-to-consumer standpoint. It allows us to take more of our brands to market via that platform. Um, their database is circa 25,000 people that we'll immediately have access to and can start to build on that across the brand group. Um, obviously, the high-touch MediClinic, so the MediClinic, this is somewhere where you can perform an injectable, you know, Botox, fillers, et cetera or go in for an LED face treatment. So that sort of reinforces our positioning in this professional space and what we would, would, would really believe that there's value in this versus the traditional retail sector. Um, and that professional positioning, we think there could be white space for um, scaling that um, down, downstream as well. So there are obviously margin and operational improvements through the consolidation of the two businesses, um, particularly all the back-end operations such as um, you know, warehouse, uh, tech stack, um, and obviously, with regards to the brands, um, right now, as we've talked about, we have exclusive distribution deals with international brands. By us looking to put that through the face many platform is going to allow us to improve margins from, from where, obviously, it was reported for them last year. So we think there's a lot of operational, um, a lot of brand and a lot of consumer synergy here in this deal. Um, we've obviously also structured the deal to ensure that the cash upfront component was really minimal, providing us the runway to truly integrate the businesses quickly and promptly and also unlock um, what we believe is, is a fast track to, to profitability. So we have kind of been opportunistic in, in this deal structure. The founders of Face Media are coming across with the deal, which is another pillar of what we believe is, is why we think we can do M&A well, um, bringing founders in as part of the, de uh, as part of the dealings um, tying them to the outcomes is is important for us as well. Um, so really, this is the the first of what we hope is is a couple of M and A transactions. Um, here, we just want to simply provide a bit of an overview. If you do follow the business already, you would have seen this announced. But this was the type of deal structure that we were successful in obtaining with Unface um, Medi. So really, it is a light touch upfront um, 
cash consideration, we is sort of the hundred thousand dollars on completion. The remaining four hundred, as outlined there, will be deferred over a period of time. There's a little bit of AM1 script, um, and then there's other conditional sort of performance-based hurdles um, over the coming two financial years as well. So, as part of that, we've picked up essentially all of the assets and IP from the business, trademarks, domain names, websites, etc leases, key contracts, all of the staff are coming across, as I mentioned. So yeah, we, we've really taken an opportunistic approach to this deal. We think there's immediate synergy for, for bringing it in and building out the back end of, of, of Anagenics and, and scaling further. So, um, you know, with, with that, um, what are we thinking? What are we thinking? How do we look ahead is really where we're at. So, you know, for us, we think we're still well, really well positioned now more than ever to benefit from the continuing changes that we're seeing in the industry. Um, regulations are evolving, um, particularly around who can administrate products. And I, I mentioned a little bit about some of those injectable style products. That's changing quite a lot and evolving rapidly. So I think we cover that with our portfolio approach. We cover that with a deal like Face Medi bringing talent on that understands how to navigate those, those changes is important. Um, majority, majority of our brands are already offering a, a male consumer a range or an assortment of products. And if they're not, they're looking at building that in their MPD pipelines. So this male consumer undertone, which has been typically, uh, the beauty industry has typically been you know, female dominated for, for years, that there are, there are more male consumers looking for, um, I guess, skin solutions. So again, our brands are positioned well to do that. Um, there obviously has been a significant change in the competitor landscape in Australia. So, um, you know, there's been lots of faults around recent competition, um, which actually provides us probably more opportunity. Um, we are focused on the professional channel. We're focused on brands with preferred brand terms, which is a key underpin of what we do. Um, we're doubling down on the market as, as the Australian and New Zealand market, I should say. We don't believe right now is the opportunity for us to go overseas. We really want to narrow in and focus here, which is why we, we sort of divested from the US and Japan. Um, and along with ensuring, um, you know, we really are really considering the sort of financial missteps of our, of our competition. And, and that really, you know, we can point to a marker in the sand with the types of deal that we've done with Face Medi, how we are mitigating, you know, the, the risk as part of acquiring a business. We're not looking at paying uh, aggressive upfront multiples on revenue. Um, that's just not the, the model that we're looking at at this point in time. And we think there are a lot of opportunities to, 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 um, to pick up on at the moment. Um, so, so really that's how we sort of see the, the industry evolving over the next decade. Obviously it's, it's fluid and it's very, very dynamic. And I guess sort of also, we just wanted to sort of round out here by, by giving some color around the, the M&A piece. So it is an important pillar for us going forward. Um, we've got work to do to integrate face many, but it's not slowing us down for looking at future uh, opportunities. Um, we can move quickly. Um, we have a clear point of view on the types of deals that we're seeking. Um, and our targets are really profitable value-based businesses across this broader beauty, health and wellness segment, which is, which is obviously a very, very wide segment. Um, we retain the agility to move quickly. Um, that's something that we sort of pride ourselves on, um, that we can be fast. We have the backing of our major shareholder, Hancock and Gore, um, which allows us to be opportunistic. Um, we, we believe there's significant headroom to drive further operational efficiency and build further revenue growth as part of these M&A deals. So for us, that's an important pillar for, for FY24 as well, uh, along with the integration of the Face Medi Group. So um, you know, with that, I think our high level thesis really is that, um, you know, our business is in a, in a process of turnaround, uh, where we've, we've, we've turned the corner significantly from where we were over the past uh, couple of years. Um, we have a strong foundation of brands and channels. Um, we've obviously now got a track record of successful M&A integration via VLC. Um, we've reset the balance sheet and have a clear pathway to profitability. So it's prime for scale and really we're just in, excited to look at um, what what opportunities we might be able to to, to bring in as part of that? So, uh, Mark, I think that that rounds us out um, for today. Maybe if, if there's any questions, we can help answer or provide any color on on anything we've been through. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions from me, Scott. The first one is um, yeah, on the M and A piece. I know you had in the, the the first slide, you know, the kind of three distinct arms of the business, if I can say that. In terms of future M and A, are you looking, you know, to do stuff more in that B2B space, 
uh, or more in the B2C space or, you know, to buy an existing yeah. brand that has its own IP, everything, and you can, you know, yeah. put that under the bucket of, okay, these are our own IP brands. Just maybe talk about, you know, where yeah. M&A opportunities you're looking at in terms of the, let's say, three segments. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, Mark. So we are being really opportunistic. I'd probably take a step back and say, where we start is looking at the segment beauty, health, and wellness. We think that's the starting point. So if we're going to summarize, you know, where do we sort of start and stop? It's more at the segment level. And then to answer your question directly, yeah, we we then sort of narrow in. Okay, is it a brand? Is it a platform? Is it a, is it a channel? Um, for that line, <laughs> um, cut costs quite well this year. Um, so we um no, so we we, we then we try to take that approach. Brands and platforms is where we would really focus, Mark. To, to get into that detail, owning a brand, owning the IP of that brand, um, you know, obviously getting the margin benefits of, of having vertical ownership is really, really important. Um, but again, we're not we're not sort of being so defined on, on that. We have had other opportunities come across the desk from a, you know, from a whether it's from a retail or other e-com platforms. But for now, I think we're we're pretty well set on the platform side. Um, what we would probably look to do next is either establish our own. Uh, future platforms, whether that was via retail or, or another arm, um, or ultimately, yeah, preferred probably looking at brands and IP. And then on the uh, spas and salons, you say, you know, it's like a, a thousand or, or 1100. I mean, that much, is that close to like the, the total market or is there, you know, still room uh, to, you no, know, lots of, lots, more yeah, lots, lots of, lots of room. Does get a little bit gray as to how you define uh, a professional salon account. The statistics will tell us that it's circa ten thousand. Give or take, it people open and close all the time. So ten thousand accounts across Australia and New Zealand. Um, that's in the professional space. That would also include your home salon. So if you're a beauty therapist as a sole trader operating out of your house, that sort of ten thousand would include would be included in our number. We don't shy away from them, but they're not our our main primary vehicle for growth. Um, so yeah, we have we have headroom here to 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 grow significantly. Um, by no means do we think we'll ever get to the ten thousand because there probably isn't quality across all of that, particularly from a commercial standpoint. Um, but yeah, we we think we're underpenetrated and there's definitely opportunity. Uh, we brought on a brand called Alpha H, which is, a, which is an Australian uh, founded brand. Um, this year we brought them under a, uh, for us to take it to the professional channel exclusively. Um, that's bringing new interest and new accounts to the table. So that's one of the one of the strategies we're employing as to how we grow that sort of eleven hundred accounts further. And then in terms of uh, positioning across the market, whether it's you know the B two B the IP products, are you trying to you know cover yourselves across the whole market? You know those like really high end stuff. You know I'm thinking maybe the imported stuff from Italy. You know kind of yeah. mid market, low market, or is it? You know, is there a particular segment you kind of want? Okay, we really only want to focus on the, the more high end, mid to high end yep. section. Maybe just talk about that across the trees. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So, I mean, the, the beauty market can be kind of segmented into a number of different, you, you cut and slice it a million different ways. So you have like a, a skin performance segment or a cosmeceutical seg segment. So essentially these are products that deliver a result uh, quite, quite quickly. Uh, sort of like a peptide style product or something like this where uh, that you actually sort of see almost a relatively instant result. You have your, your spa channel, which is more to do with your relaxation aspects. You typically would find something like that in, in the hotels um, or in a day spa style setting. You then also have an equipment, I guess, channel, uh, which is whereby there's lots of sort of pseudo medical devices that help therapists deliver treatments in the treatment room. So there's also an element to that as well. Our positioning really is in the consumer-based products that service most of those segments. So we have cosmeceutical brands, uh, makeup brands. We have uh, those spa or, or um, luxury spa brands as well. So what we don't have a lot of at this time and what we probably don't have a lot of uh, a viewpoint on is the, is the medical or the, 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 the device or equipment um, aspect of the, of the segment. Uh, that's a very different proposition. You know, you need to have these slightly different change. You have to have a whole new service model, and et cetera, et cetera. Effectively, you're selling, you know, $50,000 piece of equipment. It's a very different proposition to what we have today. So for us, we are being focused more on the consumer products. So 
Um, that is the type of product that you would go in and and um, you know have have delivered it by the therapist in the treatment room, or that you can buy at the at the retail counter on the way out of the store. Okay, and yeah, we're just up on time, Scott. Uh, so yeah. I think we'll 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 leave it there. Uh, thanks very much for coming in and uh, giving us a an update on Genix. As you said, it's been a while since. Uh, We've had a, somebody in to, to give us an update, so it's good to hear the story firsthand. And yeah, we'll keep a, keep an eye out for further announcements. Yeah, perfect, Mark. And as uh, previous, please feel free to share our details or anyone, please contact us directly if you've got any more questions or yeah, would like to learn more. But appreciate the time, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Scott. And I do know we have our next presenter standing by. There he is. Friend of coffee microcaps, we can call him at this stage. I think third or fourth time for, for uh, around the track for Sam Allard from Reckon. Sam, if you want to start sharing your presentation, I'll let you know when I can see you come. There we through. go. That should have uh, should have just come up now. Yeah, looks perfect, Sam. You can take it away whenever you're ready, mate. Terrific. Friend of the show. Thanks very much, Mark. I uh, really appreciate the the invitation back. Um, and the opportunity to talk with your presenters. Um, sorry, not just the presenters, the participants. I did have a quick look at the participants list and it was lovely to see some familiar names on the list, but also some new names. Uh, equally as attractive to see new people who are uh, interested in hearing the Reckon story. So we'll follow the, the, the similar format to the previous presenters and, and previous sessions. I just want to give an overview of, of the half year results. And I think that's an important starting point. Uh, we do report in a calendar year end. So uh, the July results, it, this is our first half result. So everything you're looking at is a, is a half year. That said, a very clean half and, and very positive results showing that we're really delivering to plan, always looking for more, Mark and everyone, but uh, delivering to plan and starting to show growth in the areas that we think we can see accelerated growth. So I'll go through a bit of a company overview. I'll present the group level, and then I've got some slides that really dive a bit deeper into the, the two operating divisions within the group, and then plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Uh, our standard disclaimer, which I'm sure all presenters have, uh, have, have flicked through. So for those who haven't followed Reckon or, or had an update for a while, we are essentially a technology company. Um, which means that we we develop all of our own tech, we sell our own tech, we support it, we upgrade it, we build new features, we enhance it, et cetera. We're very much focused and all of our latest technology is software as a service delivered in the cloud, but we've been doing technology solutions for 30 years. So we do have some very sticky uh, and very feature rich desktop products that, that are still bringing in some nice cash flow revenue for us that I can touch on as well, but primarily, primarily we're, a, we're a SaaS business and, and in the cloud. Our first half results, which we're gonna deep dive into all of these, but just as a, as a summary, uh, our first half results, really strong earnings profile, 28 million in revenue, 11 million in EBITDA, and we're, we're generating our own cash flow and, and so 4 million in net profit for the half. Uh, because of that, we were carrying a tiny little bit of, of debt. Uh, we've reduced that down to virtually nothing. So an extremely clean balance sheet. At the end of the half, we're sitting with 300K of net debt. We do have a facility up to 25, 000, 25 million with um, the ANZ. So if there's opportunity for either acquisition or M&A, or there's opportunity to fast track our own investments, we'd certainly, we've got the, the, the clean balance sheet to do that, as well as generating our own cash. Because of that, we did declare a 2.5 cent fully frank dividend. Uh, the timing right at the end of reporting season couldn't be better, Mark, with um, that, that dividend actually is declared for everyone who holds our shares on the 1st of September. So a couple of more days. Um, 2.5 cents on where we've been where we've been trading sits around rough mass at around four and a half percent yield um, and that's that's without the fully frank tax benefit so a, a good yield just in our, our dividend as a as a nice cash generating tech stock 
Uh, it was really pleasing to see our legal group start showing some green shoots and, and some accelerated growth of 19%. And whilst I'll dive into this in more detail, we, we work with over 100,000 SMEs in Australia predominantly and as well as in New Zealand. Um, and six of the world's top legal firms, primarily in the US, but also in the, in the UK. A bit of a corporate overview, again, for those who, who haven't followed Reckon closely. Uh, we're very, very proud to have a couple of great funds as very loyal and supportive shareholders. We've got 113 million shares on issue. Our current market cap is sitting around 58 million. Uh, as I said, very, very low net debt at the end of the half. And our share price high low post special dividend has been 46 to 68 cents. And I just thought it was worth me talking about the special dividend when I, when I look at this slide. So this is our business as we rolled into the start of 2023 calendar year. A very clean, very focused business. And I'm going to deep dive into both of these, but essentially our core product continues to be accounting and payroll software for SMEs in Australia. And our growth opportunity is legal software, primarily practice management and scan and print management for mid-sized legal firms, headquartered out of the US with, with a smaller team in the UK as well. 12 months ago, when um, I was, we were presenting our results, we actually had another group in, in the division. Now, we didn't, um, we didn't package that group up for a sale, but we're always looking at opportunities to un unlock shareholder return. So we were able to divest a group last year. We sold what we called the accountants group. That was in a $100 million cash transaction. It completed in August 2022. So again, we've had a very nice, clean first half this year. Um, but I, the reason I give you that background is that that $100 million transaction, that was more than our total market cap on the day we announced. Uh, and it was only 30% of our business. So it did show our consistent ability where we've got valuable assets, products and markets to unlock shareholder value if, if the opportunity presents. And the other reason I wanted to just make sure everyone was aware of that is if looking at our share price, uh, the high low is we're, we're saying post the special dividend because we did reward shareholders with a 57 cent special dividend in November last year. So that brings us to our, our nice clean go forward business. As I said, the biggest part of the group with a total addressable market of 3 million SMEs across Australia and New Zealand with a real focus on accounting and payroll. So that means we do everything from invoicing, helping managing their creditors, their cash flow, their bad statements. And we're very strong in payroll as well. So whilst we've got 100,000 cloud users on our SME products, we know that circa 400,000 individuals are paid using Reckon products in Australia today. This business brings in uh, certainly majority of our revenue, majority of our EBITDA and all of our cash generation. And the, what we talk about there is it's a very, very safe part of our business and the biggest part, but we're using that business to look for accelerated growth, look for other partnership opportunities or accelerated growth in small business or where we can invest. And where we've chosen to invest is our own business being the legal group. So we've owned this business for many years. Uh, when we were a bigger market cap or bigger revenue business, it was a smaller part of our business. But once we, once we knew about the transaction in the accountants group, we really looked to unlock value with our legal group and see if we can get accelerated growth. And there's such a big market of 46,000 mid-sized legal firms in the US that our software can sell into. So if we look at the first half for that clean group, our revenue of 28 million was up 4%. Pleasingly, we've got a big focus on ARR. And so our annual recurring revenue or our half year recurring revenue is 26 million, which was up 5% on the prior corresponding period. Very profitable company, so 11 million of EBITDA. And as I say, even as a, at an MPAT level or generating our own cash, after all development, capitalize, et cetera, 4 million NPAT result. We continue to invest in our product development across the whole group, in our business group and legal. 
and we're very happy to reward shareholders with a two and a half cent fully frank dividend. Uh, as I say, that 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 gets declared on um, on the first of September. I just wanted to deep dive into each business unit. So the first one being the largest part, the the business group. Our real sweet spot that we're seeing growth is in any size SME, but particularly in the, the, the startup economy, the micro businesses. One of our competitive advantages that we've uh, really held on to and focused on is we are the most affordable accounting software and payroll software in the market, bar none. We're easily the most affordable. So because of that, we really are attracting gig economy, small to medium sized businesses, uh, and helping them with a simple, they could just download our invoicing app and that could be their first interaction with Reckon. We could help them with payroll compliance or obviously if you put those two together and add in bank feeds, you've now got a full accounting management solution. This business has always been very, very profitable and generated great EBITDA and, and cash generation or adjusted EBITDA margins. Um, I'll just talk about the graph on the right. The green line represents our cloud users, which we've seen great growth over the last few years. And we've seen the first dip this year, which is easily explainable. I'll, I'll talk about in a second. The orange bars are annualized recurring revenue, annualized cloud recurring revenue. So our big focus is moving all of our clients and attracting new clients to our cloud products. And it's pleasing that that continues to go in the right direction. We did see a small dip in our cloud users. The reason for that was when there was a payroll compliance change in Australia around single touch payroll, we actually launched a very uh, easy to use free app for uh, payroll or SMEs in Australia to download and submit their STP compliance. The ATO just did another big compliance update called STP2, single touch payroll 2.0. We had to invest heavily in the products. We chose not to roll that out in the free version and instead encourage and really entice a migration to our paid version. Uh, in doing so, we, we, we did churn a bunch of free users, but also managed to move a big chunk of users over to a paid version, which really in, in cloud software is, is the key part. The journey for these products, and, and I'll touch on the revenue lines, but we, we've had product in market for well over 30 years. Um, so we've got an on-premise desktop product called Reckon Accounts. We were actually the Asia Pacific distributor of the QuickBooks product, the Intuit QuickBooks product. And so there is, in we, we, we did build that brand in Australia and we sold that to well over half a million uh, SMEs around Australia. That was in the days though where you literally bought software and owned it forever. So you didn't have to upgrade, you weren't paying an annualized subscription. We've had a big focus on moving those clients to an annual recurring subscription and where we can moving them to our cloud version. So Reckon Accounts Hosted is a hosted version of that Intuit code, the QuickBooks code. And the Reckon One and Mobile Suite is our newer tech that we've invested heavily and really is our go forward technology solution. Reckon one is where we're getting all of our growth. So new users, uh, new app downloads, typically come into our Reckon one suite. We do still get a couple of desktop and hosted new users, primarily from our very loyal partners in the accountants and bookkeepers channel, where they just love those products and continue to recommend them to their client base. The journey that we've we've really called out is that it's a very easy upgrade from the desktop to the hosted product. And then our hosted clients, we are essentially uh, embedding the Reckon One code in over top of the Reckon Accounts hosted product. So that allows us to transfer some of our older tech onto our newer platform. And in fact, potentially unlocks a great amount of value uh, as we get off that older desktop product and really streamline not only our internal operations, but streamline all of our client experience as well on our latest Reckon One tech. So that's the strategy for the, the business group. I just wanted to finish with the financials for that particular group. As I say, it's easily the biggest part of our group. Uh, very, very strong EBITDA margin 
and cash flow generation. We did 22 million of revenue up 3% on the, the other half. So again, these are half year results, 12.3 million of EBITDA and 4.9 million invested into the products. The lines I'll really point out are that we continue to see cloud revenue growth or cloud subscription revenue growth. We do continue to see a small decline in the desktop subscription line, albeit that that has flattened out. Um, a, a, a small incremental price increase in desktop subscription seems to flatten out any potential churn risk. And we're moving these clients ourselves to the cloud. And this other line, so the, in the other line, we do training, we've got some memberships and we've got some uh, old licenses, how we used to sell. So people used to buy those one-off one -off software licenses. We've moved all of them into the subscription lines where we can. So this line also has flatlined. Uh, many years ago, you would have seen all of our revenue in a desktop or upfront service line. Uh, it's been very pleasing to move it to a much safer cloud subscription and your recurring revenue. For the last five minutes, I just wanted to talk about uh, our then our legal group, which is what I say is really our blue sky growth opportunity. So we've owned this business and, and had technology for legal firms in the US market for many, many years. And in fact, the, the, the solutions can go global and you've even got some firms in Australia running these, these uh, NQ ZebraWorks products. Our origins actually started with cost recovery, but we've really enhanced that to scan and print management, which I'll talk about. And we actually acquired a startup business three years ago called ZebraWorks. Very regarded management team, uh, very experienced management team, and they built practice management products and, in fact, sold those products to Thomson Reuters and other organizations. And many of our team actually have run the legal tech company or, or the legal division in Thomson Reuters. So we, we think we've got a very highly regarded management team, a very experienced management team, and it was pleasing just to start seeing a return on that investment with some accelerated growth. The growth is, is coming from our core products. So I thought it was worth just trying to really outline for your, your uh, attendees today, Mark, the, the two products we've got. So the origins of the product was cost recovery, scan and print management. And you could imagine in a, in a mid-tier legal firm, they don't want their secure prints just appearing on their multifunction device. They've got a, a, an internal pass, so they go up, they swipe their security code, and it releases the print when they go up to the printer. We also help with uh, mail rooms in this hybrid world. So uh, believe it or not, we're a long way ahead in Australia, but there's still a lot of paper in these mid to large legal firms over in the US. So the mail room would actually scan all of that, all of that incoming mail and disseminate it out to the partners and attorneys. And they either disseminate it out as simply as in an email or linked to a document management or in our own routing system. So we're seeing a real increase of activity and excitement around our core products. We have upgraded them with a cloud front end, um, but the reality is there will always be an on-premise component because we integrate with on on-premise printers and multifunction devices. With those products, we're working with just under 500 legal firms, predominantly in the US, and then the second biggest market would be the UK. And then we do have resellers that work all around the world, particularly in Canada, we're seeing heightened interest, uh, and we've got a great reseller in South Africa. Pleased to work with six of the top 10 legal firms in, in the world, um, eight, and a half, eight of the top 25 firms in the US market. The whole focus with this business is continue to grow our core products into that massive market. But at the same time, we're building new cloud practice management modules that integrate with desktop practice management systems that are owned by either private equity or large companies like Thomson Reuters who don't seem to be investing to take them to the cloud. So our team are very experienced in this market. Our end goal would be to have a full-fledged practice management system in the cloud. But to get there, we wanted to release modules along the way that we could sell into the market and allow, well, not only get revenue growth ourselves, but allow users to have a 
legal firms to have a new cloud interface over a much older desktop practice management system. We're seeing great interest in these products, albeit very early days. So Billing Queue manages all of the billing workflows, uh, the collection management, the accounts receivable. We also integrate with a payments platform on that. So we do see a potential for accelerated uh, cut through revenue or click through revenue in payments. And we've got Data Queue being a data, a business intelligence data analytics reporting tool. Again, today we integrate with one practice management provider. Uh, by the end of the calendar year, we would have rolled out the second and by the next six months in the, in the half next year, we would have rolled out the third integration. And each time that massively increases the market for our new cloud platform products. We often get asked about cross-sell. It obviously makes sense that we can sell the whole integrated solution to a mid-tier legal firm but it is also a nice opportunity that if a firm's not taking our core products, we have an opportunity to sell the new cloud platform products. The legal group, as I say, we do see a longer term potential real a blue sky growth opportunity in the large US legal firm market. And it was pleasing just to see the start of that. We're up in our subscription revenue of 19%. Even if you, 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 you normalize that with constant currency, we were up 13%, uh, you'll see a big decline in our upfront and service revenue. Just wanted to explain that. That is essentially, we've moved our licensing structure from an upfront service model to a subscription service model. So what we've taken out is any upfront software licenses. There will still be an upfront implementation service but essentially all the software licenses have rolled into that subscription number. If we'd normalized it, our growth would have been a lot, a lot more, but our focus is growing subscription revenue. That's how we're selling the software and that's how we're gonna to report to the market. We won't decline um, by a similar percentage in 12 months because that 400,000 for the half, that is a pretty typical upfront implementation and services revenue. So we see that being the, the true constant revenue line going forward for our upfront and implementation. So overall 12% growth, 6% uh, at constant currency. It's break even at an EBITDA level for the first half. But as I said, we are investing in this business. So we invested two and a half million into development for the half, um, but we're generating a lot more than that in our own cash flow, even within the business group. So. We believe the size of the market and the opportunity to really accelerate this growth, that this could become our high growth opportunity whilst we continue maintaining and supporting small businesses with a very safe, low growth, but highly profitable business group. I've kind of flown through that, but also aware that uh, we wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, Mark. So I'll throw over to you and the, uh, the participants. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, just a, a question from me, um, more on the competitive landscape or reckon one, where does, you know, the, the New Zealand business, Henry, which I start to see their marketing a bit more and more around, uh, around Australia, where do they compete against you or, um, you know, in terms of market dynamics, um, you know, are you kind of yeah. pitching to a slightly different customer to them or are they fo yeah, focusing like, a slightly like different area? Like you said, we've certainly seen a lot of their marketing and investment in advertising spend. So they're definitely on our radar and, and I would put them as a, a risk and a potential future threat. We don't seem to be get we don't seem to get compared to them at all. I mean, one of the attractive things that Henry offers for their clients is the ability to do the bookkeeping and, and accounting work. So they do have a services model in their infrastructure. Now businesses that we're attracting the SMEs, whilst the accounting and bookkeeping channel is super important to us, the SMEs that we're attracting uh, aren't going to their advisor first. They're actually looking to be self-started. They're looking to send some invoices, do some payroll, manage their accounts and cash flow. So we're actually attracting a different client base. And, and as yet, certainly haven't come up against them as, um, as competitors. Typically, we've always competed with MYB. Uh, and both MYB and Reckon, who have been here the longest in Australia, uh, we were both disrupted by Zero, who, who really are a well-known brand. 
that we are the, the typical three that are in the conversation when under review for an SME. Okay. And then um, in terms of the, 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 I don't know if we can use the term legacy de desktop version, but I mean, does at some point, does it make sense to, I guess, force a migration and say to your clients, you know, that this is going to be discontinued and you have to move to, you know, hosted slash slash reckon one you know the you know yeah, so, you know the you know the cost of maintaining does. it versus the customers who are left on a kind of um balance yeah it look it definitely does at the right time mark they are they're extremely loyal extremely comfortable and sticky clients that we're very happy to service you mentioned the cost to maintain it uh majority of our investment and cost to maintain goes into reckon one as our new tech stack which which also supports hosted so it's not expensive for us to maintain it we do get a lot of value creation and synergy if those clients were to move over to the rec and one code base so yes does it will it make sense at some time just to to turn it off it absolutely does the key question is when is that and right now it's not in the next 12 to 24 months we don't have to force that migration and we're very we're very happy to support those clients provide and we're really offering the the carrot instead of the stick at the moment mark so we're offering incentives to upgrade and migrate to either hosted or reckon one um but at some stage we can use the stick and say we're we're not supporting that so that product going forward and you do have to upgrade but i would see that more in a three to five year journey okay so we're, we're a bit we're a bit away from it yes um and then just uh, on, I, I know you touched on in terms of um, the shareholder breakdown, the Novati group who, you know, are uh, a major shore, shareholder. Now, can you just talk about, you know, where that partnership is? Because I remember when it was announced, there was, you know, talk of, you know, getting their um, product suite, you know, integrated with Reckon and, and kind of vice versa. You know, there was um, a, a lot of potential crossover um, maybe talk to yeah. maybe some of the tangible products and services that have kind of evolved since they, they came on the register, I don't know, is it 14, 15 months ago now, maybe? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, maybe maybe just over two years ago, they, they, they might have come on to the register. So look, they've been a, a very supportive shareholder, um, but an even better operating partner. And and one doesn't require the other. I'll, I'll just make that statement. But um, they did come on the register and their whole, their whole comment was that Reckon works with over 100,000 cloud users. They, they dominate, they, they work, we work really well with invoicing and accounting software, and they've got integrated payments technology. So we have managed to work very closely with them. We've embedded their payments technology. It's called Reckon Payments. Um, we've got, it's low growth at this stage, Mark, but it's, it's, it's also because it takes a while to get that product out and educate, but we would have 250 of our cloud users as merchants actively using the Reckon Payments product. We would be doing circa 250,000 um, every quarter of gross transaction volume. But when you're talking a revenue share of 0.005%, uh, you, you really need millions. So that is, completely a volume game we're very very happy with the partnership with Novati they've got some very innovative technology um, and we look forward to hopefully seeing those 250 merchants turn into much closer to the 100,000 cloud users that we've got yeah so it's still uh, yeah still early days and as you say uh, int integrations and payments and and all of that it, it does take quite a while to 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 really get it going yeah and and then I think the key is we've integrated the tech it's up and running any user can download it one there's a sales cycle and even if i was the reckon one client and turned it on i send you an invoice it's now your option whether you click on that payment link or use the qr code or use any other innovative way and one of the things we're really excited to be launching with Novati, we're in a beta at the moment is the ability to tap your phone and to get tapped by a credit card on your phone. And, and we're very big in the trade industry. So we think that that's gonna be a well, well received by our clients, the ability to take a credit card payment on their phone direct. Um, and that will integrate very well with our invoicing app. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so 
my brother's a tradie. I'll I'll ask him if uh, if if he if he sees it coming out in the next few months. Um, Fantastic. And then just the last one, just a quick comment on on capex for the for the second half across the accounting group uh, and the legal group. Should we kind of expect something similar, or or is there you know some kind of big project planned in 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 either of those for the for the next six months? No, great question. Absolutely, that that's a consistent capex spend. Um, we we've we've told the market verbally. We've said we we likely spend around fifteen, but for the full year. Uh, so we spent yeah just under half of that at, at the half year. Uh, we're pretty much at full head count. We focus heavily on our on our on our team to have a great team. Our development are in house developers, so we've got a big team here in North Sydney as well as teams spread throughout Australia. We've also got a big team spread throughout the US, but they are full time employees, not outsourced developers. So our two headquarters are, are Phoenix, Arizona, and North Sydney. But then we've got resources all around the US for the, the legal group and all around Australia for the business group. But yeah, CapEx should be consistent. We feel like we're at full headcount, Mark. It's very nice to have a clean balance sheet um, and really no debt. Five years ago, when I, when I stepped in, we had 30 million of debt. We've managed to really re reduce that. So we, we've definitely got options to invest more uh, each quarter, each half if we can see that driving accelerated speed. Yeah, perfect. Sam, we're just on time, so we'll have to, uh, to have to leave it there. But uh, thanks very much for coming back in and, and joining us uh, once again. And yeah, we'll keep, uh, keep an eye out for announcements and hopefully get you back in a later stage. My pleasure. Thanks very much for having me, Mark. Thanks, Sam. And I do believe, yeah, we have Nick, England Executive Chairman of Quorum Group uh, joining us, uh, normally based in Sydney, but he's out west today. I'm just going to share the presentation for Nick here quickly. Um, okay, Nick, uh, afternoon. Um, you tell me uh, when to move on to the next slide and, and we'll kick off. Well, Dave, thanks, Mark, and, and, and thanks you all for, for attending. Um, I think kick off maybe with a bit of background about Quorum Group. People don't, don't know who we are. Uh, we've been a listed business for over 25 years. Um, we're probably best known for our pharmacy software business, which has been around for a, for a long time. Um, due to competition, a few, a few mistakes, that business has declined over the years. Uh, and we, in 2020, we acquired a business called Farmers, which is a electronic gateway uh, a business which dominates the market, connects all the pharmacies and the major suppliers in, in the market. Now, that business has grown substantially, and the board felt that it, it, it uh, provided a much better growth prospects than, than the pharmacy software business. And... Funny enough, last month we disposed um, of um, of the pharmacy software business to a company called Jonas Software. So our results are, 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 are been adjusted and and very much reflect um, just the ongoing operations, which are, are two things: one, the pharmacy business that we acquired, the gateway business, and secondly, um, a business which we launched, we piloted at the back at the early part of the last financial year. And launched in October, a, a business called Pharma's Change, which is a, a B2B marketplace for the pharmacy industry. If you want to move on, Mark. So just the important disclaimers regarding um, regarding the information I give you today. And again. So really just looking at the uh, operational highlights for last year. Uh, the main thing uh, happened at the end of last year, which uh, was the sale of the pharmacy software business for a, a total consideration of 6.25 million, uh, four, and a half, four and three quarter million up front and a, a one and a half deferred for 12 months. Uh, there's also the potential for earn out payments based on recurring uh, annual recurring revenue on the, on the first and second anniversary of completion. Uh, and this really completes the streamlining of, of the business. We had, uh, in addition to 
this business. We had a, a real estate e-commerce business that we disposed of in, in 2020. So we've we've streamlined the business, uh, reduced its its um, complexity, and made it a lot easier, I think, for for investors to to understand. And the one thing I'd raise is the pharmacy software sale is subject to shareholder approval, which will happen on which there's an extraordinary general meeting on the 20th of, of September to to debate that. So that that, that business is proven proven. Uh, Difficult, uh, very little growth because the number of pharmacies don't doesn't hasn't been growing. Fairly competitive for the so the the um, the scope for price increases has been it's been limited. So the board was approached about eighteen months with a uh, with a with a deal. It's taken that long to to complete. Uh, I think trying to do any deal in this sort of environment has been it's been difficult. But we managed to get it away, and we now. Going going forward, we have the, the two businesses, Farmers and Farmers Change. Uh, the Farmers Change business, the B2B marketplace, was, uh, as I say, piloted early part of, of the last financial year. Uh, we really launched October. It's it's gained fantastic traction. Uh, we've got now over 1,900 pharmacies in the, uh, signed up to this platform, so that's well over a third of the market. 175 brands and, and seven and a half thousand products, um, including some of the major um, pharmacy supplies to the pharmacy market that there are, the, the likes of Halion, Aratex, Blackmoors, uh, Reckitt Bankers. Uh, these are the major supplies to the marketplace that uh, understand the, the the proposition we're putting out there, uh, and it's been a, that's been a major achievement for the business over the past over the past year. The third thing is a bit of a legacy issue. So uh, upon acquisition of, of Pharmex, there was a, a legal dispute over, over a change of control provision uh, that should have been given by one of the, uh, the owners of that business years ago. Uh, we were successful uh, in that legal action uh, and we were awarded a, a sum of 8.1 million, including interest in costs. So really the, the, the point about that out in the pharmacy software business is that we we we, we pretty we've got a fair bit of cash um, swelling around in our books. So the a there's capital management options and the and investment options that for, for the board to be considering. So do you want to move on, Mark? Sorry, one second. Here we go. So I said that the there's going to be an EGM in September to debate the um or to vote on the sale of the software business. There's another resolution, which is just to change the name of the company. I think the quorum is very much associated with the um, with the pharmacy software business. We will propose and change the name to Pharmax Technologies Limited. And just to give you a bit more flavor of the, of the, the two arms again, Pharmax you know, acquired in, in 2020, this is a dominant gateway. So it's a, it's a messaging gateway whereby pharmacies place their orders electronically and receive their, in, their, and receive their invoices electronically. Uh, it's been in existence since 2006. It's a trusted, almost industry standard uh, gateway. There is no current competition to that, to that, um, to that gateway in the market. In Australia, in New Zealand, we've got a, a small but rapidly growing business uh, that's been helped along by the entry of Chemist Warehouse into the New Zealand market about three or four years ago. They insist that their suppliers use Pharmex as, as a gateway to to integrate with their business. Um, and the way we've built this, we've got seventy one suppliers. We can that over $18 billion worth of transactions last year. And each one of these integrations has been, has been pretty much custom built to with the supplier systems. Uh, and those top 70 include the, all the top wholesalers in the market and most of the top direct suppliers. Now, the, the revenue model for Pharmax is that we charge the suppliers, not the fact there's no charge to the pharmacy. So we charge a, a fee Per, per active pharmacy per month. So it's a, it's a membership fee uh, for, for, for use of that gateway. 
that uh, we, we increase those charges by CPI every, every year. So it's been, that's been low growth over the past, not low growth, but low, low CPI over the previous few years. The last couple of years have been pretty healthy increase for us. Farm Exchange uh, is, is a B2B sales and marketing marketplace. Um, it's very closely integrated with the Farm Ex Gateway. Uh, and the revenue model there is, is different. So the, the revenue model is the sales commission model. So again, we charge the suppliers, but the suppliers don't pay anything unless they they, they uh, derive revenue from the from the um, from the platform. We have a, an integrated payments facility. So uh, it's not a matter of traditionally uh, suppliers would sign up people to to accounts. They they don't need an account. You can just Put your credit card details into our payment facility called Farmers Pay, and, and pay before the goods are received. We've also developed a, a, an education centre for, for supplier and training and, and education materials. And what we're looking to create here, so just want to go. What we're looking to create here is, is like a, a centralised hub, where 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 people can access information, can order product. Uh, and it's a one-stop shop for the for the market. And I think each one of the each one of the individual suppliers have created their own their own hub, their own website. Uh, and I've probably discovered the fact that pharmacists want to be able to order easily. They order predominantly through their point of sale material. Toggling between different websites doesn't really work. As I said before, we uh, we've gained rapid traction with this brand. We're, we're thrilled with with the traction it's got. Nineteen hundred pharmacies now, and and seven and a half thousand products. So, what does the business look like going forward? So, um, Mark, do you want to just move on one? So, the pharmacy business has been around since two thousand and and seven. Uh, when we got involved in 2020, the average number of suppliers that a pharmacy connected with was 4.9. It, it's now 7.5. If you remember before, I said there's 71 different suppliers on the on the uh, on the platform on the uh, uh, on the gateway. Now, not every pharmacy is going to order for each one of those 71 suppliers. They 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 won't range those products. But the, and the highest number of connections in any one pharmacy is 21. So what I'm saying here is that the growth runway is moving upwards every year. Set the 4.9 to 7.5, we'll, we'll move. We'll never hit 21, but we believe there's a huge amount of runway left, left to go. Uh, that 7.5, we expect to move one half to one every, every year uh, uh, going, going forward. Uh, and you can see from that chart, and it details the number of accounts. So in October 2020, we had about uh, 37,000 accounts, and now April 23, we're up, you know, 54,000. So we're growing those connections. Now those connections, and 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 the total connections year on year grew 19% last year. Now they don't, then why isn't that reflected in the revenue? Well. Basically, they don't pay for inactive accounts. So you see the smaller blue line that's growing at a smaller, um, a small, a, a slower rate. Uh, two reasons for that: one is the fact that there's always a lag between growing the connections, where we've been very focused on that over the past year, and then activating those connections and getting the message out to the pharmacy market that these suppliers are now live on on farmers. The second thing is the fact that there was there's one particularly structural change in the market that happened last year, which was Pfizer, who were the, were the largest uh, uh, drug company in Australia, changed the way that they distributed their products. They they went from a direct or an indirect supply model through DHL to the wholesaler, a, a wholesaler distribution. And what that meant was is we, we lost probably 3,000 accounts as, as people, as DHL were paying us uh, on a monthly fee basis. And it went into the wholesale model who were already paying us and, and, and they don't pay for incremental volume. 
Uh, but the transaction value is increasing 16% year on year. So uh, the point is, this is what I call our, our bread and butter. This is uh, the, the thing that will be growing, I believe, double digits going forward for, for, for many years to come. Um, so uh, some of the reasons why. So looking at the sort of the, the environment we're in today, uh, I think everybody's probably heard about the uh, the new introduction of what's been called 60-day dispensing. So this is where the government has um, allowed the top 320 PBS medicines for GPs to be able to prescribe them in, in 60-day installments rather than 30 days. Uh, what that means is that this, pharmacists get paid for every every time they dispense a, a, a medicine so they're from the top 320 medicines, their fees will halve. Uh, patients will only have to pick up their medicines on long-term medicine prescriptions every uh, six times a year rather than 12 times a year. Th this is this is going to have quite a big effect on pharmacies. You know, uh, we're looking at six-figure uh, reduction in, in income, um, which will probably drop straight through to the bottom line. So this... All the pharmacies and all the pharmacy groups in Australia are looking at how they how they're going to compensate for this um, for this introduction of the of day dispensing, and they've, they've been through all the you know political trying to trying to fight it, uh, and now they're concentrating on what's the practical ways of actually making things better. Uh, we believe pharmax pays will play a massive uh, role in this, so. If you look at what happens if you don't use pharma, it's, it's you down to manual processing. Um, you ever go behind the scenes in any of these independent pharmacies and you'll see somebody pretty much full time on a computer inputting um, inputting invoices into their accounting software, uh, faxing orders, picking up the phone to phone reps, massive inefficiencies there. And, and you know, the, 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 the two ways of, of they can they can bring that person out into the front of the shop and get them selling and increasing the customer service or it, in the worst circumstances, they might have to dispose of that person to, 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 to save money. So there's a big drive now for efficiency. Pharmacies have a, a you know, pretty good run in, over the past few years. And I think now there's a chance for us to actually start pushing pharmacies a lot harder in terms of its role in, in driving efficiency within pharmacy. You always look at the second side of things, so the supplier side. Uh, Australia, a very expensive uh, market for a lot of suppliers to to service in terms of not just in terms of reps, but every time a pharmacy sends a fax to a supplier for an order, it's, it's creating work, manual work at their end as well. So that they've got the same similar sort of efficiency drivers at the supplier end as well. And then the third one is this, this, having disposed of our pharmacy software business, we, in a way, with, when we had that business, competed with some of our important partners. And those, those partners are the point-of-sale vendors. And point-of-sale vendors have been incentivized by a, a rebate mechanism to help drive the connections within, uh, within farmers. And I guess th there's been a bit of a reluctance sometimes because Basically, if they, the harder they drive that, they the more they reward a competitor financially by, um, you know, by driving revenue to the pharma side of, of the core arm. That independence now has been welcomed with open arms by our competitors, and we, I'll, I'll give notice of a couple of important partnerships we've struck since we announced the the sale of that business later on in the presentation. So. Those are the sort of environmental factors. The we're not just sitting back and waiting for the, the those things to drive our growth. We are seizing the opportunity by being proactive. So assume you know our, our director of pharmacy marketing about about pharma, it's the importance of pharma, importance of pharma in driving efficiency has been stepped up. We're uh, pushing our ADMs. We we we're doing a whole series of webinars for groups to educate them about where they can they can uh, realize these efficiencies and, and training people on how to get their 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 pharmacists connected with 
with the various suppliers through Farmers. Whilst we've got 71 suppliers on there, we'll continue to, um, to add suppliers where it's, it's in both our interests. And there is uh, some added functionality uh, we, we can add, which I think will make, make the, the uh, gateway more attractive and, and particularly in New Zealand. Um, and we've struck a number of, of uh, agreements with retail groups to for them to add suppliers to the to the gateway. So that's that's Farmex uh, and the growth in now Farmex. As I said, we 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 thrilled uh, with with how it's how we started. It's a proven to be a, a compelling proposition. So piloted uh, late later middle late last year uh, 1900 pharmacies on board now as of as of today number of suppliers uh we 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 we, we have sold the dream the stage is set the issue now god is how do we convert this interest in, into sales and and that's what what we totally focused on now is is having this interest We've got the brands on there. We've got the proposition. We've got the, the technical um, platform. How, how do we execute? You want to move on, Mark? So the big thing, the big learning has been how do we change the behavior of a pharmacist? They order through their point of sale. Um, and as when, when we own the pharmacy software business, uh, nobody, you know, we had, they had to order through the web. People really weren't going to help us because we were a competing point of sale uh, business. We had an integration with our own uh, our former software business, Corn Health, and we have struck two important agreements. One in one in very recent days. So with Z Software. We've probably got about 1,200 pharmacies out there, Minfos, who are about 900. So we reckon we're just over 50% of the market with these who, who, who now will integrate the pharma exchange access into their point of sale software. So one of the big barriers has been this, this ordering behavior. We're now able to say, well, there's an automatic click through from your point of sale to the pharma exchange platform. And we think that will that will change radically change the behavior and make ordering the ordering a lot easier rather than having to to go on to uh, go online um again supporting it with webinars retail group contracts a lot of a lot of direct marketing we have a promotion running at the moment which is a, 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 the ability for pharmacies to win a two business class tickets to europe um based on certain purchasing uh, criteria over, over a 12 week period so we'd be looking at how we can incentivize people to to get on board and i think what we find is that when people order once or order a couple of times they become what i call habitual users of the platform that behavior is changed uh, there's a lot of hard work to get them to that point but once once they become habitual users we we, we see them the exploring more and more suppliers on the platform and ordering more and more we have a, a very, very healthy pipeline of, of suppliers. Um, we we're adding them, we're adding them weekly. Um, we've got a I say some of the some of the major suppliers in the in the marketplace on there. Uh, and we we add, we'll add and we continue to add further functionality to drive loyalty where it be, where it's commercially uh, sensible. Uh, we've got this education center, we get requests for Further functionality, it's got, to, it's got to make sense to us and to our partners. Uh, but we, as I said, we're, we're pretty early days, but this conversion is probably the crucial point for us now. So onto the onto the financials. Um, so like for like, as, as I explained before, this excludes the pharmacy software business. Um, first, time for a long time we, we we got a substantial increase in revenue like for like revenue growth was 14 percent we previously always reported 
uh, combined figures. Uh, we didn't want to split out PharmEx and, and, and the pharmacy software business for competition reasons. And our revenue always looked flat. And, and we always knew that uh, the pharmacy business was, was growing substantially and the, the, the software business was in decline and basically just masking the success we were having. And now we're, we're a much easier business to understand. Uh, we believe that revenue will, will continue to grow. In terms of uh, underlying EBITDA, I, I, I would call it underlying because we've had the, the, the court case, we, we've we incurred substantial legal costs, which we've stripped out. It was uh, 1.2 million uh, last year and, and 0.8 million the year before. So we've, we've our underlying EBITDA has declined by about 216,000 year on year. And, and the main driver of that is we've, we've invested over 500,000 in the launch of farm exchange. We've also added to some of our technical resource in Pharmex and, and we've we've moved Pharmex to the cloud. So all sort of costs that we've, we've incurred during the year, uh, which contribute to that underlying uh, EBITDA. And, and pretty much that's the reason why most of that's dropped down to the, the impact line. I guess the only other point to make there is the fact that we on the launch of of, uh, of farm exchange, we, we, we've started am amortizing the farm exchange assets. So there's a little bit of amortization there as well. Um, in terms of cash, we we generated a, a million of cash, and despite you know the, the spend I outlined earlier on, and then this, as I pointed to before, we've got we've got a lot of cash on hand. This is this we've got the cash from the league. Okay, so now uh, that's subject to appeal. So there's an appeal that's been lodged. It'll be heard the uh, first two months of calendar year uh, 24. Um, so we've not we've not accounted for that, but it doesn't include the proceeds of the um, of the disposal. So we've got if the court case goes our way, we'll have probably after after tax and and, and restructure probably 17. Or say a million dollars cash in, in hand. Uh, onto the PL, the, the, again, you've got the revenue growth there. The, 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 again, just to uh, emphasize where we are on the costs, we've, we, we've got a, a, we're a listed business. So some of the costs that uh, were spread across uh, uh, two, biz, two, large, two business units are now across one, some of the corporate costs. Uh, and we've, we've, Mainly to do with the cost of launching farm exchange uh, has contributed to that to that rise. Um, and then moving on to the cash flow. So really, they, there's been a, a decline in the cash flow mainly due to the, the launch of farm exchange again. Uh, and then really, the, the only other point I want to make there is the sort of investment into intangibles. Um, we. Uh, that's probably half half was into the um, into the former business and, and half into the new pharma pharma exchange business. So we're uh, we expect that investment into intangibles to uh, remain at probably fifty percent of that going going forward. So really, in 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 terms of summary, um, it's a positive we positive result we we feel we're very well positioned for growth um we've put a very simple business now to understand in terms of farmers which is what i call our bread and butter this is the the gateway business which will grow as we grow our connections there are quite a few macro reasons why we believe that growth will continue uh the fact we're now independent i think gives us a a, a great a great way of building relationships within the market. Uh, we've no distractions. We've no excuses. We, we've the legal case and the and the sale of the business has been a bit of distraction. Now we fully focused on on, on the growth of these two arms. Uh, Farmex with its gate with its, with its uh, growth runway, and this is we we're all down. Now to how we successfully commercialize farm exchange, we've got the traction. How do we drive that conversion? And if we're successful in doing that, there'll be a massive step change in growth for this business. Plenty of cash, 
uh, valuation of the business you can you can look up based on um, EV, EBITDA, multiples, it's very, very low. Um, and on top of this growth within Australia and New Zealand, this is a this is now a technology business. We we can we can apply this sort of model to different verticals within Australia uh, and different businesses that you can identify with, which are this sort of typical mom and pop um, type businesses with that that are need some efficiency drivers uh, and also different different geographies as well. We're we're in New Zealand. There's further growth to be obtained there, but there isn't really a, a farmers type model in a, in a lot of markets. And um, it, the longer term, there's there's a there's a great um, uh, opportunity for us to to be able to drive farmers further than it, than just a, a local Australian business. So that's really, in a, in a nutshell, I'm you know happy to take questions. Um, uh, it's you know it's, it's it's been a, it's been a great story, it's been a very exciting year. There's a, a lot gone on, uh, and we feel as though we're in a pretty good place going forward. Uh, thanks, Nick. And uh, we're just about out on time, but we have one question from the audience. I think somebody might have just joined us late, but just to go back on the on the farm exchange revenue model. Can you just uh, just um, go back on that and just how the the business makes money out of the out of the farm exchange model? Yes, yeah, so, so it's a sales commission model. So we charge between five and ten percent of the wholesale value of the order. Okay, perfect. And then just one quick question for me. I know on the the farm ex side, you said you you know five and a half thousand pharmacies in Australia, which I'm guessing is pretty much the total total market. And you're expanding now on the back of Chemist Warehouse in New Zealand. What would be the the size of the pharmacy market in in New Zealand? I mean, do you know rough numbers how many there is in total in that market? Yeah, it's about it's about nine hundred and fifty. Um, so it's it, it's smaller. Hmm. Um, I, I guess what Chemist Warehouse have done there, they've created a they've created an you know they've become a bit of a behemoth over there. They they've taken a lot of market share, so pharmacies there are, are, are looking for efficiencies. Uh, as they were in Australia for, for slightly different reasons, the competition there's, reasons. Uh, there's there's a potential plus minus another thousand that uh, could yeah. come onto the the Pharmex uh, side of the business. Sure. Okay, Nick, thank you very much for for joining us. Um, it was good to get an update. As you said, there's been a kind of a lot of change in the last. 12 or 12 or 18 months um with launches and disposals and legal cases so yeah it was good to get some uh some clarity and yeah hopefully we can have you back on in another couple of months uh once we're a bit further down the track in fy24 great thanks mark appreciate it thanks nick and thanks everyone for joining us today and uh just a reminder we have four more companies presenting tomorrow afternoon um, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. if anybody wants to join us tomorrow. And with that, I wish everybody a good afternoon. Thank you.